Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you to our Grow with Redbud series. This is our final presentation in our Grow with Redbud series. And tonight's presentation is Rainwater Harvesting and Rainscaping Strategies for Healthy Watersheds by Nancy and Ames Gilbert. Before we get started, I want to make sure that you all understand that our presentation will be recorded. And the wonderful thing about that is that it will be posted on our website so that on the same place where you got the Zoom information for this program or the uh, live stream information so that uh, you can look at this again later or share the link with friends and family. Uh, all all of you, all the participants, uh, including ourselves during the presentation, all, all the participants will be on mute and video is turned off. And please leave these off. That helps us conserve uh, bandwidth for everyone and helps everyone focus on the presentation. You can submit questions to myself, the moderator, by typing in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, Ames and Nancy will answer as many questions as time allows. They really welcome questions. So you can enter the, the questions at any time during the presentation as the questions arise. To access the chat in Zoom, uh, you'll see if you uh, take your cursor down to the controls at the bottom of the Zoom screen, uh, you'll see that chat comes up. Click that and uh, then you'll be able to see that. Uh, if you have an Android phone, You'll have to click more before you see chat. If, you've been, if you're on an iPad, uh, you, the controls may be at the top rather than the bottom, and you may have to click a series of three dots before you see uh, chat. In YouTube live stream, chat is already clearly visible. So uh, with that, I turn it over to our president, Jean Wilson. Uh, thank you, Chrissy. Um, welcome everyone. I wanted to talk uh, for a couple minutes about Redbud, and then I have the pleasure of introducing Nancy and Ames, our speakers for tonight. Um, Redbud is one of 35 CNPS chapters covering the state of California. We serve Western Placer and Nevada counties, and we've been um, in existence for over well over 25 years. Um, almost a third of all California native plant space species are native to Placer and Nevada counties. And that's pretty amazing given that there are almost 8,000 native plant species in our state. Um, so that means well over 2,000 are native here. We have a very wide uh, palette to choose from when we want to plant native plants. Our chapter has over 300 members. Together we learn about and grow and protect our native plants through field trips and presentations, horticulture and propagation, uh, discovering rare plants and taking action to protect our botanical heritage. We hope you, you will join our efforts if you can. Um, you can do things like attend virtual programs like this one and hopefully at some point in the not too distant future be able to attend live programs as well. Check out our online field trips, and again, we hope to be able to resume in-person field trips as soon as we can. We have a Facebook group that's very active that has several hundred members, and you're welcome to join. It's a great place to get your questions answered and to uh, share information that you have. You could join a Redbed committee, such as our education committee, our membership committee, or conservation advocacy committee. Um, you can volunteer to help with projects such as our online plant sale or some kind of restoration project. And we also have openings uh, in the slate of Redbud officers. We're going to have an election coming up and we'll be sending out a message about that in the not too distant future. Um, or uh, you could be a committee chair or a committee member. So with, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Nancy and Ames. Um, they are, they have been involved with Redbud for over two, dec two decades. Um, Nancy is the Redbud Horticulture Chair and has also served as the Education Chair. Ames was the Redbud Newsletter editor, editor for several years. Um, 
Nancy has a master's in science education and as an environmental educator has given presentations for the Redbud chapter, such as this one, as well as to organizations throughout Nevada and Placer counties. She has also worked with local schools and nonprofits to bring nature education to school age children. Together, Nancy and Ames have vast knowledge of native plants, their pollinators, and the birds that depend upon them. You may know their beautiful artwork and photography photography from the Redbud Plantidote series on Instagram. This series features images and fascinating descriptions of local native plants, pollinators, and birds. Nancy and Ames have owned and operated both a native plant nursery and the Far West Bulb Company, which specialized in California native bulbs. Both are certified permaculture designers, and Nancy was the base landscape architect for Beale Air Force Base for 18 years. They have taught extensive workshops on site evaluation and assessment to help individuals understand their own property and develop their own site plans. This knowledge of native plants, permaculture, site evaluation, and landscaping informs their presentation tonight on rainwater harvesting and landscaping strategies for healthy watersheds. Thank you, Nancy and Ames. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jean, and thank all of you who've provided the technical background to uh, allow this to happen. Uh, viewers may not know, but there's about uh, five people who are handling the technical details and making sure this all happens smoothly. So uh, please applaud them. Uh, this presentation um, is an introduction just an introduction to what is really a vast topic. Um, the backbone of the presentation is going to be the permaculture principles of um, <clears throat> slowing the water that arrives in your land, spreading it out, filtering it, and storing it, and sinking it. And uh, the idea is that however and in how, whatever quantity the water enters your land, um, it's going to be uh, cleaned and any that does leave will be in better condition than when it arrived. <clears throat> in this uh, first slide, there's a beautiful piece of art by uh, John Pitcher. Um, it's based in Washington, a little more uh, rainy than here. But um, it shows what a, a beautifully established garden could look like. We're going to be covering uh, the water cycle and principles of groundwater recharge. I'm going to explain some of the best management practical, best management practices for how you conserve water and how you control erosion. And we're going to <coughs> strategize with rain harvesting strategies to slow and spread and sink rainfall and storm water runoff. And we're going to cover plantings and plants using biomimicry for your rain garden and bioswales. I uh, just wanted to mention um, this is really um, an introduction because this is a really big topic. And there are tremendous resources on the internet. And when you um, get to the end of the show with us, uh, I have a plant list and also on our uh, new Redbud website, we have a tab which will, uh, Chrissy will explain to you later, uh, which will take you to this plant list as well as a very extensive list of resources so you can further educate yourself. This is really intended to motivate you and educate you enough that you might want to try some of these uh, ideas on your property. Um, with global warming, I think more than ever, our water resources are vital and sinking our water and uh, runoff and storm water on our property and in our neighborhoods and getting it out of the storm drain systems, as well as basically that filters the water so that when it finally enters its destination at a lake or a ocean, it's not full of sediment and pollutants, but nice and clean. Um, so Ames has already covered these topics that you see on this, uh, this slide, what you'll be seeing. These are our broad topics. As we go along, we'll get into a lot more detail. These uh, symbols, which uh, Nancy and I have used throughout our series of lectures, they're all our own standard symbols. 
um, uh, self-explanatory. The water symbol means that this slide covers something about water and so on and so forth. Soil, vegetation, wildflower, wildfire prevention and uh, plants or topics that have particular wildlife value. So we're going to just start out with some general principles and um, many of you may be familiar with these things, but some may not and to really get the best out of the show and the information. It's good to have some of the basics covered. Um, I think first we need to know what a watershed is and we each need to get to know our local watershed and it, it was quite a while before I actually looked and saw what our watershed is here where we live. It happens to be on this map, which was provided by the Sierra Streams Institute. You can go online and you can Google your rivers and like the American River watershed, the South Yuba, the Bear, and there are maps and a lot of really great information to help you get to know your watershed. In our case, it's the Bear River. And that includes um, all the land that channels rainfall and snow melt to the streams, creeks, and rivers within our area. And eventually, as you can see on the map, they will flow down through uh, Jeans area and Dutch Flat we go. And then we have Wallens Reservoir. Uh, then we have uh, Lake Combi. And unfortunately, when we get in this area, at least by my estimation, the proposal to install a Centennial Dam will dam the last six miles of free flowing river in our watershed. It already has eight dams on it. So uh, if it's held up here, that means a lot of water will not probably reach, that would normally reach Car Camp Far West Reservoir, won't get there. And this is used to irrigate a lot of farmland down here in Wheatland in these areas. The river then flows as does the Yuba into the feather and the feather flows into the Sacramento and into the very depleted San Joaquin Delta where we need groundwater recharge. So if you look up your watershed, you can start to see the connections and I think it's really good information to know. Just as a little aside up at the top part of the map, that is Ridge Road, and it's called Ridge Road because that is the ridge that uh, separates the Bear River watershed from next door. So we, um, this slide shows uh, basic principles about groundwater aquifers and how they form. Um, usually they form on top of a um, impermeable layer. In our particular part of Western Nevada County. Uh, the most wells are drilled um, into random occurring uh, cracks and little pockets of water. Um, elsewhere, lower down, um, there are these layers, um, as you can see in the slide. Um, our granite is fractured, and that's the only place in Western, most of Western Nevada County that the water collects. Uh, fossil aquifers are very deep and they're often capped by an impenetrable layer. So a very big aquifer over on the <coughs> middle of the country, the Agala Aquifer, is fossil water that took um, hundreds of thousands of years to uh, creep down there. And now we are drilling wells, we're sucking that dry. That's also happening in the Central Valley. Um, <clears throat> what we try and do in our practical work is uh, maintain the vegetation, um, keep our water clean and try and sink as much as we can into our local uh, cracks and crannies in our granite. And if you note uh, here, you can see the roots of some trees can penetrate down at least 30 feet. They're going to help raise the water table. Uh, so for fire prevention, yes, we need to thin our forest, but you do not want to denude your property because they're helping to reach, to pull the water table up and help maintain our groundwater supplies. So this, uh, we have three quick slides here we'll cover, it just shows the watershed process and what happens in a natural condition of water cycling here before humans 
come in and change everything is a balanced um, uh, condition where 10% uh, of the rainfall is runoff because it's intercepted by vegetation, by very nice porous soils, and it infiltrates to the ground. So you are recharging all the various aquifers deeply. You have very little sediment entering the ocean. You're also recharging alluvial uh, deposits. And of course, we uh, then support plant life and some of the water is lost to evapotranspiration and transpiration. Whereas in a human um, occupied urban area, this is what you see in a quite an inverse situation. Here where um, humans congregate together, we tend to make uh, impermeable uh, landscapes. Uh, water collects and runs off the roofs. It goes into uh, roadways, which are generally impermeable. Um, the uh, intersections of roadways are usually concrete and impermeable. Uh, people's driveways are impermeable. So then it collects into stormwater drains and runs off um, into the ocean, bringing all the sediment and pollutants that it's collected on the way. And you'll notice these arrows, your recharge of your groundwater is completely reduced, which is the problem with dense uh, development uh, in all areas. So the solution is what's called green infrastructure. In this case, we try to offset the loss of uh, infiltration and filtration and sinking of our rainfall by redesigning our urban areas and towns and also us out here in the country, uh, redesigning and modifying our landscapes so that we can now reduce the surface runoff and sink it within town proper on our property restore a clean water supply where we enter into lakes and large bodies of water and recharge our groundwater, which is benefits every living thing and benefits us with our wells. This is a cross section, kind of showing what goes on in this cycle. As you can see, we have a cross section into a river. We do have transpiration and evapotranspiration here, but by having the native vegetation remaining, the overland flow is slowed down and filtered. We're getting good infiltration, both at this level and at lower levels. It's running along here and coming in underground through seeps. Um, we also see the percolation here into our groundwater. So basically, when you remove vegetation and pave things, this whole water cycle is turned upside down. So the watershed approach to landscaping is a term that's being used a lot. It's being used now on the CNPS gardening websites. Um, they use that word because it basically is a form of biomimicry. So what do we mean by biomimicry? Well, it's basically you're creating solutions to human challenges by emulating nature, the designs and systems found in nature. Uh, this book author of this book defines it as the conscious emulation of life's genius. So we can design our landscapes and our properties and our cities and our communities to mimic what goes on in nature so we restore and sustainably accomplish our goals to slow spread, filter, and sink water. What we're seeing here in these photos that I think helps illustrate this is this is Hunter Creek on the east side of the Sierras. It runs through here. That's the major corridor for the, the creek. And we have small ravines also coming into this watershed. Obviously, where there's more water, there's more plants. But one very interesting thing that's been discovered recently is the plants are, and the mycorrhizae associations aren't just benefiting the plants down here. They are pulling that water 
up the banks of these creeks, up the banks of these ravines and spreading it to other plants so that there is a benefit beyond just that narrow corridor. So when you do a rain garden or bioswales or both, this is a community gathering here in uh, Oregon. They're doing a community rain garden and they're mimicking this system. These are the sides of the berm, as you can see here. Here's your creek or your lake, which is down here. The plants match these zones of moisture to, this is your saturation zone. The sides are a little drier. And then when you get up here and out here, you're, you're into the drier regions. We're going to introduce the term uh, BMP, which means uh, best management practice. And uh, the following slides are from a little show I gave many years ago on some of the practical aspects that uh, Homer scales can do. Um, when you design a BMT, BMP, um, the very first thing is to decide what kind of rainfall it can handle. Um, you were concerned just one to two years. You want to be able to deal with a 20 year storm or a 100 year storm. Um, these terms have become um, uh, much more commonly used and uh, it's very, very hard to pin things down, but you need to decide uh, what kind of capacity your BMPs are going to produce. Um, this graph here comes from um, the website that's shown there on the slide, uh, uh, Water West. And this shows for Nevada City um, from 1893 to uh, 2016, the rain rainfall patterns. It shows, um, you can see the minimums and maximums and you can see the long-term trends as well. Um, that's very valuable information, especially if you haven't lived here um, all your life. Um, it helps you design your BMPs uh, adequately. And we'll talk a little more about this later and we have some books that will help you calculate for rainfall with climate change and the erratic climate we're having, I highly recommend you over design your rain gardens and your swales because we're getting these more extreme events, which you're starting to see right in here, uh, bigger spikes. And after 2016, I expect they'll get more extreme. So we're trying to uh, mitigate the effects of uh, the impermeable surfaces that we have. Uh, nobody wants the roof to leak, so all the water that falls on the average roof uh, collects and either goes to gutters or falls over the edge, but it's uh, very concentrated. And then we have uh, the average driveways and the average roads, which are also impermeable. So the water, when it rains, uh, sheets off to the side, goes into storm drains, and um, uh, every now and then there is a ditch and culvert system which transfers the water away from uh, a road. <clears throat> so you need to start gathering some data. The first is the area of the roof or uh, sidewalk or pavement that uh, you want to mitigate. Um, you're gonna, we're gonna show you how you work out how quickly um, rain can infiltrate and you're gonna to have to work out the capacity that you need to uh, spread out so it just doesn't run off and uh, get wasted or cause damage. And then finally, you have to work out uh, what's gonna happen if your BMP is overwhelmed. Um, we've had an inch an hour in recent years um, on several occasions and we, the Gilberts, uh, had our BMPs overwhelmed. That means to say our little mini dams broke. Um, we had flooding in our nursery and so on and so forth. So you're gonna do your best to design against that. Um, you can do calculations yourself and we've got a few um, examples of that. Our resources demonstrate how to do that or you can hire an engineer. This photo here is, uh, these are interlocking pavers. They are a bit pricey to install, but they're extremely durable. And if you were to use this on your patio or your driveway, instead of being impermeable, it allows 
uh, moisture and water to run through. You can even now get and have installed permeable concrete, which has big enough pores that it will infiltrate, infiltrate water. Um, this is what's called a channel drain or a trench drain which solves some problems. In this case, it stops the water from uh, getting into and rotting the garage. It also then is channeling that water into a planter here, which will then uh, infiltrate the water. So there are so many amazing solutions. It's really worth uh, doing some research and thinking about how you can improve the situation at your own property. This is just a real general idea from this, again, wonderful Washington uh, Rain Garden Handbook, just showing some of the things you can do on a broad scale in a typical large suburban lot. Uh, here's the rain garden. Uh, they've saved as much existing vegetation as they'd like. We'd probably have and encourage you to have a smaller lawn in our area. Um, They've used native plants here. They've got a permeable pavement on their driveway, a green roof, which we won't get into that because that's a very def definite engineered. They've got a cistern coming off their uh, gutter, which they can then use to irrigate later. Uh, they also have um, splash blocks here, which can then, you can direct that roof water to your rain garden if you wish. And finally, you can uh, amend the soil, and that's a big topic of itself. Um, hard pan soil, uh, thick clay that's un unmitigated um, will prevent uh, infiltration, and that's something that you can do on a local scale in your own plot of land. Especially if you buy a new home, and these times usually your soil's really been modified and and compacted and you'll need to improve it if you want good infiltration. So BMPs um, in this slideshow are uh, practical, um, actionable uh, ways to uh, slow down and infiltrate water and prevent erosion. <clears throat> As I said before, we're trying to slow and spread and filter and keep as much water on your land as possible. So that's just a basic principle. Uh, the permaculturist ideal is there's not a single drop of land of water leaves your land. You also want to prevent soil from leaving your land, which means protecting any bare soil. You have to have a little bit for uh, native bees and creatures like that, but, but you don't want large expanses. You want to maintain all existing vegetation. It grew up, it's exactly right for the area. Try and keep as much of it as you can. Um, you're trying to mitigate the soil and uh, get rid of large areas of impervious cover. And uh, you're trying to protect your slopes. So this can happen on any scale. There's another term you're gonna run into a lot if you get online and start looking at uh, uh, rainwater harvesting and best management practices, and that's called low impact development, which is actually often used in the same way that a BMP is. It, it's a site design approach that conserves and uses the natural site features on your property and integrates them into the stormwater controls. And you're again using this kind of idea of biomimicry. Um, we've already pretty much covered these. There's a couple extra things here. Uh, we're going to be talking about different kinds of swales, vegetated, uh, cobbled or rock lined swales, Berman Basin swales. These are all really interesting ways to keep water on your land. Rain gardens and bioswales can be combined, so you can have a series of them on a hillside. Uh, we'll talk about small and large scale detention, retention, and settling basins. Uh, this is an infiltration trench here, which has been installed instead of just your traditional sidewalk. So all this water coming off people's uh, roofs and the sidewalk is being sunk into the ground here and creating a really beautiful landscape and infiltrating water. Um, this is a cobble lined bioswale, which in a larger application is more practical in some ways, but must be maintained because this can silt in. And then we're going to talk a little bit about check dams and weirs and waddles and different strategies 
on your land? I went on um, a course um, up in Lake Tahoe for several days, and many of these photographs are uh, taken as I uh, explored um, the Sierra Nevada Alliance um, practicum that was given. So, so Lake Tahoe um, has this water clarity problem. So there started, they started a long time ago trying to work out methods of getting the water clean before it enters Lake Tahoe because one of the famous attractions of Lake Tahoe is how deeply into the water you can see. <clears throat> so they have, uh, by law, uh, brought in many, many of these BMPs and many of these principles have been worked out up there. <clears throat> all these principles that we've mentioned before, uh, they are trying to put into practice. So we're trying to reduce impervious cover. Uh, there on the left, you can see at the front of the stairs, they've got uh, cobble, that's, uh, that's cobble over earth and uh, with stepping stones going through it, that's a very good way to spread and sink the water that's coming off the roof. Um, as far as is possible, and sometimes I've even given out grants to do this, you've ripped up your regular driveways and regular pathways and put in permeable paving. Um, they try and reduce uh, concentrating water. So some roofs uh, will have um, a just drip right off the edge, which mitigates the gathering of water in gutters and concentrating that down in downspouts but downspouts are often necessary, so then you have to spread out the water again. Um, <clears throat> you can see uh, that what they're trying to do in all four of these photos is uh, reduce the speed of the water, and you can do that by using rough surfaces. You can have large rocks in the way, so the water impacts the rock and has to go around the rock. That's a, a kind of baffle. And you can use bioswales, as in the right hand top, uh, rain gardens, which is what we're going to concentrate on, vegetated swales, infiltration basins, dry wells, and all these other methods of sinking the water and preventing runoff. This is a vegetated swale in a setting where there's lawn around it, so it stays green all year and it, it's really quite beautiful. And um, here in California, this would be hard to keep up without having some irrigation or water entering it year round. These are taken in Nevada City and Grass Valley. Uh, this is a, a, a hard, hardened swale, which carries the water through pipes to a series of basins, which is kind of what they're doing here. They've got a big settlement basin here, and it's a very, very steep, as you can see, site. So they've used a lot of cobble to harden it, but it still sinks water. So this is um, what we're trying to avoid. Uh, up at the top, there's a uh, horse pasture somewhere anonymously in the county, <laughs> which has been incredibly overgrazed and you can see the cracks in the earth and you can see how the soil is uh, just moving along uh, whenever it rains. Uh, the lower left was taken <clears throat> just after a rainstorm and you can see again the, the pattern of erosion um, in this case, they tried putting some wattles, you can see that up at the top, which is basically a, a woven net with a straw in it, um, not doing so much good at that time, it was wrongly placed. Uh, on the lower right is an example of far too much of the land clearing that goes on in our county, where basically everything is bulldozed and ripped up, and then these giant uh, piles are uh, accumulated and set fire to in the winter, which makes a very hot fire, which sterilizes the soil underneath. And until it's covered, until something grows on this land, uh, wind and rain uh, will just keep blowing the soil away. The other downside is basically this site will probably just be invaded by a lot of exotic weeds. 
because of the amount of disturbance. The whole seed bed's been disturbed and the annual weeds will take it over. So in their effort to reduce fire and clear it, they're actually probably creating an even more flashy fuel situation. So this is a situation a uh, little more ideal if you can do it. Um, you're, this basic concept is really important, especially now with our efforts to reduce fire hazard and have fire safe communities to try to find balance. Uh, Chris Paulus, who's a member and has done a wonderful presentation on this idea of trying to balance ecology with fire safe principles is to maintain the healthy existing vegetation on your property and um, keep what you can if it's uh, healthy, suitable, and non-invasive. Non uh, ob the obvious reasons are listed here. Um, this is an example, uh, actually, uh, up in Grass Valley of, instead of just removing all manzanita, they have left some of the big specimens, limbed them up, and chipped around them. And this allows the root systems to still hold this all together. And manzanita is a, a terrific habitat plant for wildlife. This is a woodland that was just on our road that was terribly overgrown with incense cedars and conifers, which has been uh, thinned. So it's less of a fire hazard, but in, trees have been left to hold this steep slope together and reduce erosion and allow the rainfall. This is a beautiful garden in, in outside Grass Valley where a very artistic approach to pruning back your manzanitas and creating almost like a window frame here. And then they seed the bottom underneath with mostly annual wildflowers and bulbs. So they have this beautiful spring color, but the good thing is this stuff can all be cut back in the summer and it will still um, come up next year and reduce fire hazard without uh, stripping the soil. This is, uh, I'm able to talk a little about this. This is kind of like, this is being done a lot in our county and it's not necessarily always the wrong thing to do, but it's, it, uh, using a masticator has issues and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that if you are trying to clear your land using these, this heavy equipment. Whether it's uh, good or bad depends um, an incredible amount on the operator and the scale of the equipment. Um, this is uh, a pretty large, loud machine. Uh, the operator can't actually see the flails um, uh, there at the front. Um, so he's uh, several feet behind um, the, the damage that's being caused. And he can run into trees and strip the bark uh, turn over the soil, the lower, this is after it has been through, you can see down at the bottom. It looks nice and clear, but the soil has been completely turned over and there's quite a bit of damage to the trees. This is what happens with a non-experienced operator and operators that don't know anything about uh, native plants and uh, need uh, to keep them uh, safe. So we personally recommend hand clearing. That's what we've done for 20 years on our land. Um, it's uh, very, very hard work and we can certainly understand why people are in a bigger hurry um, than they don't want to spend 20 years doing their land. So you often get weeds coming in on a site like this, particularly if you thin it as well and open it to the sunshine. So it's, if you hand clear, you just don't get as much disturbance, so you don't get as many weeds coming back and you preserve your herbaceous undergrowth. Uh, we do understand that sometimes in these big shaded fuel breaks, people have to do this, but if you don't have to do it, like Chris Paulus on the American River project, a lot of that was hand cleared and hand burned. This is blew my mind actually. This was, uh, this is the NID ditch and uh, some really rough operators came in here and cleaned this parcel and uh, they use bulldozers and masticators and this is how they left it. So I would hate to be getting on the downstream side of this NID water. Uh, this is going to be a real problem when we get rain. So part of the maintenance of healthy existing vegetation is this thinning. Um, 
top photo is on our land. We had uh, <laughs> uh, 80 trees uh, come down because of the beetles. We had to cut them down. And last winter we had uh, 15 huge piles and we had to burn them. But it's all done by hand. Um, and afterwards the, burn, the fire's burning fairly cool. It's not scorching the ground. And afterwards we cover the, the scar and we'll have a nice open area and already there's shrubs um, c coming up, uh, all sorts of interesting plants, including some bulbs that probably haven't flowered for the last 30 years. Down below is a, probably what is the best method of clearing if you can do it, which is um, a controlled burn. Um, here we are on Lower Colfax Road, um, doing a controlled burn. This was about um, one and a half acres and it took five or six people um, a morning and uh, that has reduced the fuel load incredibly um, and helped the health of the land and reduced all the uh, excess duff which is also a big problem um, nowadays when we uh, don't have fire in the landscape as often as we should. Now on a prescribed burn like this, this, this whole site was prepared for this. It had already, the wood, woodland had been thinned out. So you just don't go out and start a prescribed fire randomly. The site has to be prepared. We had an experienced forester and uh, uh, someone with a great deal of experience with prescribed burns uh, overseeing this. And it was really quite amazing. Uh, the, the nice thing is, all the nutrients are returned to the soil in, in this light fire ash and you haven't compacted your soils and you get all kinds of really wonderful natives coming up that flourish after fire. This kind of emulates what the indigenous people of California did for millennia. Um, so there is now a prescribed fire association in our area and if you're interested in prescribed burns, I really recommend you look them up. This is just a little more on healthy vegetation and I'm, we're gonna kind of just quickly address different habitats. Uh, chaparral is what is really being uh, seriously developed in our county on basically ultramafic, very high mineral soils. Um, and they just do the bulldozer approach and they decimate all of our chaparral plants, such as this beautiful lemon, Ceanothus. Um, if possible, chaparral needs to be thin for fire, but you need to leave a plant like this supports unbelievable quantities and diversity of native bees, beetles, flies, butterflies like this juniper hair streak. Um, and uh, if you can manage to leave small patches of it and some mulch on the ground, it will maintain its wildlife habitat value. Same in a woodland, by thinning the woods, we actually have more birds, not fewer birds on our property, particularly the woodpeckers are, uh, have moved in. We left a few snags for them, which you can do. Uh, and this is a nice meadow, which if you leave some of the deer grass and other elements there, it, infill, it, it basically sinks a great deal of moisture. There's almost no runoff from this meadow uh, and it's very wildlife friendly. And this is kind of a panorama view of our mega burn going on. You can see all the piles here. <clears throat> we'll be at it again this winter. And then I think we will have accomplished at least four or five acres of uh, thinning and have a fire safe area uh, near our home. So the principles are protect bare soil from erosion. And this can be done in a number of ways. This uh, top photo shows um, uh, chipped mulch. And this is on a very successful uh, local commercial property. And it shows exactly how it should be done. The bushes and shrubs in understory are gonna carry on growing. Uh, the owner will maintain this these uh, uh, chips, but eventually it, there won't, won't be any need for any more. Um, this bottom slide shows what is sometimes called armoring. Um, the water is going to be moving 
at enough speed that it needs to be slowed down. And this is cobblestone. Um, at the edges, uh, the water coming in is slowed down with these native grasses. And um, that's a much better way. Conventional lawns sink water, that's absolutely true, but they also require a lot of water and they require fertilizer and everybody who has a lawn knows about mowing. So it's better to keep the lawn areas small and then uh, replace as much as you can with this kind of native prairie, this uh, native deer grass and uh, forbs and herbs and uh, low plants. This is just a quick slide. Um, a lot of this is do it yourself. This is our former mighty Mazda with one heck of a big load of uh, wood chips and grindings which you can achieve if you're willing to go load your own truck like this. You can also sometimes get lucky and have an arborist or a tree maintenance company deliver them to your house. They can take a bit of nitrogen out of your soil. I usually add a little compost or buy pelleted fertilizer uh, to um, help it compost more quickly. Um, it can wash out on slopes, so we've used various methods to slow that down. You can, um, we tried jute netting, and this is pretty much what happened to it. Um, the squirrels used it for their nests, and they also chewed up all our cedar log bark for their nests. So, um, when you live in the country, sometimes you have issues, but it's worth it. So back up in Lake Tahoe, these are some examples of uh, BMPs. Uh, the one at the top um, is armored in the middle and with earthen sides. And that took uh, two things. It took the roof uh, water, which was not sent in through a drain. And it took uh, water from uh, the neighbor uh, who was uphill and um, sank that. Uh, up there in Tahoe and a lot in our area, there's, there's lots of decking and stairs and so on. The water is concentrated and drips down pretty hard um, in the gaps. So this is a sensible thing to do. And this also, especially for fire, you can see they've uh, armored uh, with cobblestone all the way underneath. And they maintain the armor or the integrity of the armor against uh, infiltrating leaves and things like that by blowing it off several times a season and getting rid of uh, any duff and keeping it clean. And then that keeps it uh, fireproof and slows down and mitigates any water coming down. You may even have to go in and do periodic weeding, but that's, uh, that's life on your own property. So these are some just quick examples of what, how you can deal with slopes, which are a big challenge in our county. Uh, a lot of people inherit a new home or an older home even where the bank is just completely bare and all the water just sheets down, erodes, uh, ends up in the uh, storm drain system or clogs up your, uh, your, your ditches. Uh, this is a terraced approach with rock which is quite beautiful and also gives you planting opportunities here and slows and sinks the water. You can also locate um, a swale at the top or of, a, of a steep slope, whether it's terraced or not, and start sinking the water, which they're doing with vegetation here at the top. Uh, this is our bank at our house, and we actually had so many logs. We, this bank was just terrible. It was basically a cut and fill bank. So we put in with rebar, holding them in place, a lot of logs on contour to hold the mulch in place and then pocket planted a lot of natives with some additional soil amendments. And now the whole bank is vegetated. In fact, I can look right outside my dining room window at this once horrible bank and it's now fully vegetated. And we have things like this epilobium to look at and all the insects. Um, uh, you can also uh, use boulders and intersperse them on steep banks to slow the water and sink it. Uh, you can use cobble. Uh, you, you can see the here that basically you also create wildlife habitat while you're at it. Here we have um, the first season of a new building site that was local. 
and uh, they did what they were told and uh, put in these long wattles. These are about 25 feet long and they're pinned down to the ground every now and then. And they spread straw like they were told to, but you can see what happens because uh, it wasn't carefully thought out. The straw was, wasn't uh, thick enough or sufficient enough and it's actually probably the wrong material. You can see it's just piled up as a dam against the wattle, but it is better than nothing. Um, in the middle, there's another badly done, uh, the water um, badly done mitigation. It met county standards, but it wasn't individualized for the site. And you can see that uh, the water came in and eroded down this uh, center channel. Even though up where Nancy's put in the arrow, there was a wattle very similar to the one on the left. So these are unsuccessful or half successful mitigations. On the lower right is a, a much better kind of wattle. Um, it's uh, been much more carefully engineered and it was laid on contour and it's uh, worked out very well. And it's uh, completely biodegradable. De These are invented only in the last half dozen years. Yeah, wattles can be useful, but they're, they're very temporary. And I think most people think that's it, I'm done. They're really not intended for that. And not to mention if you uh, have all that straw on your site in the summer, it's one heck of a uh, fire hazard. Uh, pathways is another element. Uh, if you use paved pathways, all that water is going to sheet off. So um, these are some nice examples of a, a member's home where he did this beautiful pathway system using boulders, rocks, and gravel. Um, very pleasant underfoot, uh, hasn't compacted the soil so the tree roots are all healthy and he's sinking water on his site. Uh, you can use um, just regular road base. You can use crusher dust, decompose granites, very beautiful. Uh, it's good to use something that uh, locks together though, or it can just all, you'll have to edge it or it'll disappear. Um, up at the top is a well-managed pasture. That's a happy horse there. Um, there's, uh, it is mostly non-native grass covering, but it's uh, well-managed. The swale down the middle is not been um, uh, trampled bare. And um, if you go out in the rain, which I highly recommend if you want to explore the efficacy of your BMPs, um, go out with a slicker during heavy rain and have a look and see exactly what's happening with your culverts, your paths and so on. You'll learn an awful lot. I went out to this pasture during a one inch per hour event and the water was coming off beautifully clean. This uh, lower sh uh, photo shows a uh, pond which is um, used for settling and it's, uh, it, it's a retention basin which um, holds the water back and then when it reaches a certain level which you can see there in the middle it overflows and in this particular case it goes to another one um, but it could just go to a local stream if the speed and the quantity of runoff is uh, right for that. These are usually engineered on this scale. Uh, a rain garden is kind of a mini version of this. This is usually in a commercial area where you hire an engineer. Every now and then these uh, basins uh, do require maintenance. So every now and then they're going to have to be uh, cleaned out. This top photo here shows a little retention basin I dug. So the water collects and then if it gets high enough, it goes into that culvert on the right. And about every five years, I have to go down there and I can usually gather uh, three or four wheelbarrow loads of silt. Then I go and put them, uh, take them back uphill and put them on my garden. This photo was uh, at our former habitat garden at the Briar Patch Co-op, but it's now a parking lot. So <laughs> nevertheless, we did a lot of work here and planted this because it wasn't planted and these willows came in on their own. This is the outlet and these, the height of this determines whether it ponds for a long period of time or a short period of time. And that principle will apply to a rain garden. The height of your outlet will determine the depth of your water. 
And again, got to be professionally engineered. So this is showing the basic principles of why you want to vegetate a slope um, in order to infiltrate water and slow it down. This is a beautiful uh, local landscape uh, where a very steep slope, he retained the trees up here, installed some boulders, got native bunch grasses and ground covers here, such as Arctostaphylus. And this all filled in within a year and it's completely stable, no runoff at all. So here we're introducing uh, the idea of swales. A swale is a little depression um, it can by, be either a little depression with a berm downhill of it or just the depression itself. Uh, most swales are put uh, on, not exactly on contour, but with a slight flow. So the water goes and collects in that little ditch or swale and then flows very slowly towards uh, the next spot that you've planned. If there's a berm um, that allows you to collect more water, slows things down and you can see on the lower part where Nancy is indicating uh, there's this plume of water um, which uh, forms underneath that berm. All that water that's collected there does not go downstream, down the slope. So this is recharging the water and slowing it down. In this case here, they've got a long, long slope and they put a uh, vegetated swale at the base to sink it at the bottom. These are just some examples of armored swales. They're called bioswales. This is a series of swales that carry water, drop into a basin where it settles, and then it overflows into the next one. Um, and they've used really nice native plants up in here and used boulders to break it up. Um, they do require maintenance because if you let this silt in and don't blow it out and clean it up, it will cease to function properly but I think they're aesthetically really attractive as well as functionally smart. This is a, a, a big meadow down in uh, uh, the Christian, uh, kind of near the Placer Nature Center uh, down a little lower elevation. And this whole meadow was, this whole area was scouring completely out due to uh, a huge amount of water coming in from all the surrounding hills. So the owner had all this leftover timbers and although it's not particularly beautiful, these check dams is what they're called, temporarily slow the water and the soil builds up behind them. And this stopped the scouring and also slowed the water. And then she started really developing almost like these vernal pools in her meadow. Um, I visited there this spring and this whole meadow was just fantastic. Um, and she also installed these weirs on the main creek running through here. They're made of concrete and then she's got riprap here, which slowed the water down. And she basically saved her meadow from just basic, from having this enormous gaping um, scoured out ravine down the center. And the entire thing was just loaded with uh, bees. So check dams can be on a really big scale, as you can see here, and Ames could talk a little about this. Uh, here's a mini scale, a medium scale, and here's a big project. Um, in the top photo, that's a, a smallish pond, maybe um, um, a quarter of an acre, and it's a concrete uh, weir um, outlet, and they've put a lot of uh, big rocks where the water uh, hits the lower surface and roils up the water, and that stops erosion there. So that, that drop there is about uh, uh, 18 inches. In the lower left, this had to be engineered. This was on a uh, much larger scale. It's at the UC Davis Arboretum. It had uh, much more water to deal with and it required uh, engineering. These little patches, light colored patches, you can see to the left and right of the main channel have uh, just been planted and they will grow up with uh, willows and sedges and rushes and other appropriate plants. And uh, we didn't go back, but in fact, it uh, take photos, but it has uh, filled up nicely. On the lower right is uh, the Gilbert uh, local ditch dam. And um, th th this is uh, designed to collect sediment. Um, clean water is supposed to come out at the bottom and sediment is supposed to collect up at the top. 
And in the local following slides, I can show you exactly how that's done. So I did dug a little trench, I laid in cloth, put a cedar log across, hammered in uh, drilled holes and hammered in these uh, pieces of uh, steel rebar. And that uh, uh, those little dams that I've just made, uh, they're about eight years old now. I've cleared out the sediment probably once every two years and they're still there and still working. Here's a few more quick uh, ways to manage roof runoff. Uh, we all know about splash blocks. Uh, they actually do help quite a bit if you have a nice uh, composty soil here that can infiltrate the water. Uh, and this will work, that's probably the simplest solution, but I think far more interesting and attractive are things like rain chains that uh, end up going into some kind of really attractive barrel here, which overflows gently into this planter. And this is actually a rain chain from a roof going into a dry well, which we'll talk a little bit about later, and is surrounded by rock, the whole area designed to infiltrate that runoff instead of sending it into a storm drain. This is an example of, we won't get into the details here, but there is some uh, hard work involved if you decide to do a dry well. It's a way to take water away from your driveway or an area that where you don't want it and send it out with a French drain such as here to this container. In this case, he just bought, used a drum, it's drilled full of holes, and basically he infiltrates the water out here and saved his garage from rotting. Um, this comes from instructables.com. They have a lot of really helpful uh, videos and how to do it yourself projects like this. Um, these may require a, a permit from the county, particularly if you're in town or you are doing it on a large scale. So you should always check uh, with your uh, planning department, your building department, if you start to doing uh, fairly large projects like this. So you can see that was a good um, illustration of the principle of uh, taking the excess water, storing it somewhere, and letting it out at a much lower rate. This is um, an example of permeable paving. Um, a local builder let me take some photographs. Um, <laughs> it looks pretty nice. Uh, so the water, this has to be prepared. Uh, this is not done on bare soil, it's done on a, a bed of um, uh, gravel and sand and it's carefully tamped into place and there's a skill to doing that. Uh, but uh, the water is able to just flow sideways the width of one brick and then it goes and uh, is uh, sunk down. The lower photograph on the left shows how he's doing the retaining walls, it's the same project. Um, the same idea of permeability. It is on a prepared concrete foundation and there is a French drain behind it to reduce the hydrostatic pressure. If you don't know what that means, the hydrostatic pressure, and you're building a wall that's over four feet high, you should get it engineered. Yeah, and they were able to save this tree because if you uh, use permeable paving and are careful, its root system will be intact. These are just more examples of do-it-yourself Pavers, a uh, lot of work, but um, ultimately pretty low maintenance once they're done and you can garden in and around them and you infiltrate all the water rather than having it run off. And here's some solutions to the solid uh, driveway. Uh, these are a pavers, just two runways for the tires. So you minimize the amount of uh, asphalt or concrete in both these. And this is actually a fire, this is designed for fire engines to be able to go on it without creating this massive amount of impermeable surface. So that was required because the fire engines weigh 40,000 pounds and they uh, can't drive across a lawn. Yeah, now cisterns, we're not gonna get into this because it's a huge topic and they're usually engineered but some people's wells dry up or are so poor uh, they can uh, they need either rain barrels or cisterns frankly rain barrels in our area 
because we have such a long dry season really aren't that that practical unless you were to store many many of them up behind your house so you know cisterns can be polycarbonate metal fiberglass or if you are into aesthetics in this case you can go to companies like uh, innovative water solutions etc and they uh, help you with these kind of enclosures with cedar this this one has the roof water going directly into here and then it's being pumped out these also can work for fire protection and you can uh, have a source of water for the firefighters in fact the firewise fire safe council now has a new document on how to retrofit large storage tanks for firefighters to use and you don't necessarily have to pump it from your well it come come could come off your roof so now we'll get into the kind of fun part, which is um, rain gardens and bioswales, a little bit about building them and the plants. This is um, from that wonderful book from Washington State University Extension with the plant shown around here. And a lot of these very same plants from the state of Washington work very well in California and in fact are native to California. Um, so uh, we'll go forward. Uh, this is a cross section of a typical rain garden. And like I said, this book will tell you more detail how to do this. Um, here is a pipe coming. In this case, they used a pipe to bring the water from another location. It could be a driveway or their roof. It's underground. You could have also brought it in with a, a, an armored swale. Uh, you excavate and usually you have to first, we'll talk about this, you need to test your soil to make sure it actually is porous enough to absorb the water. Uh, in many cases, this layer has been amended so that it's nice and permeable and it can be like six to 12 inches deep. And then you usually have six to 12 inches of water capacity to pond. You have to balance your berms so that they hold the amount of water you've designed for and then your overflow could be a pipe, but in many cases is a bioswale. And we'll talk more about some of the plants you're gonna put into this area a little bit later. Um, this is more of an urban application. This is probably engineered, but in this case, instead of just asphalt or concrete or a lawn, they've actually specifically designed this with a sub base of a very porous gravel topped off with a nice loamy soil and it drains into here and percolates this water down into the groundwater. Um, it, that way it doesn't go into the storm sewer. So Ames will talk a little about some of the things you do to plan your garden and also how you can calculate in just a few short sentences here. You need to calculate your infiltration rate. Um, starting at the bottom, um, calculating infiltration rate, you're going to uh, <clears throat> dig a hole, um, let's say 12 inches deep. You're going to pour in a certain amount of water, let's say an inch of water, and you're going to measure how quickly it uh, gets absorbed by the soil in uh, 24 hours. And that will tell you the infiltration rate. There's, when you go to our resources page, it'll tell you how to dig that hole. You don't want to glaze the sides. You don't want to compact the bottom. You want to make it uh, as natural as possible as the, the final solution um, will tell you how to uh, make your swale or your uh, garden. In this case, they only use six inches of water. This one, 12 inches of water. This one over a shorter period of time, this one longer, and they have a measuring device uh, there's then an equation. I'm not going to read it out to you, but it is available uh, in the resources you use that will allow you to convert that to how many inches or portions of an inch your infiltration rate. Then it will take you to a chart, which gives you information as whether or not you need to amend your soil or dig it out and add soil. Um, this is a, a photo from a class we taught years ago uh, where people uh, actually use layers of trace paper to design their garden. And this is a very 
it's kind of like a low tech way to do AutoCAD because you've got layers and if you don't like what you did, you can throw it away and put another layer of trace on there. It's a very nice, easy way to design your garden. Um, after you get done here and you've determined your drainage rate, then you have to decide where is a safe place to direct your overflow once you've decided where you're going to locate it. And you always should consider impact on your neighbors because it's not uh, neighborly to send your water to their yard. And um, you have to have a location that will accommodate your garden. And there are many parameters such as leach fields, utilities, the location in relationship to the foundation of your home. Uh, the guides that I'll show you later give those in very great detail. And it's very important when you do a rain garden to follow their advice. So this just roughly tells you then simply um, in a, a diagram how you would build a rain garden on a slope, which is a little trickier. Um, and I, we probably don't have to go into this completely, but this will, this um, information is in the book, but you, you have to use a level in order to make sure that your berm <clears throat> is the right height. So you excavate here and this creates your basin. You move the excavated material to create your berm, which you can see in plan view here. And that gives you um, a little ponding area here. Um, the depth will be determined by your a sizing chart based on your percolation rate. So you will then have an overflow from this because you should always plan an overflow because if we get a big rain event, it can top your, your uh, rain garden and really damage it. You usually also have to compact your berm soil enough that it is stable. So here's a plan view of a typical rain garden. Here's the cross section again. This would be like the outer rim of it, nice shape. And you basically are going to have three zones in a rain garden. You're going to have your inundation zone, which means much of the winter in our climate, it's going to be underwater or very wet. In a temperate climate, that might be year round. In California, this zone might actually totally dry out in the winter, in the summer and fall, which makes it challenging because there are some plants that will do both of these, but it's a, it's a limited a uh, palette of plants that can, some of the rushes, uh, juncus species can sit like this in a lot of moisture and dry out and make it. And some of the sedges and there's a few other plants. Um, however, if you want this to be really beautiful all year, I recommend you install an inlight emitter system in here and give it water in the summer so that you can have really beautiful flowering plants in here as well. And that will uh, then take you up to the sides of the berm, which is kind of like the banks of a canyon around a lake or river. This is an intermediate zone, which is going to be getting some of its water and roots down in here, transferring it up. So this is an, a moderate to low water use zone, but um, a lot of our natives would be happy here. Then up on the top of the berm and down the backside and over into your other landscape, you can use basically zone three plants, which are fairly drought resistant and can blend in with the rest of your landscape. So you'd really need to provide water in a rain garden to establish your plants, just like you would in any garden. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility with drip irrigation now. You can use little sprayers, you can use inline emitters. Um, you could use overhead water. Uh, if this was next to a lawn, it could just receive some of the lawn water in the summer and look really good. Uh, this top photo is uh, there for sentimental value. That is, is the briar patch, is that <laughs> our demonstration garden that we worked so many years to uh, produce and make beautiful. And it is now um, the new parking lot, totally uh, paved. Um, impermeably paved. Um, we have some strong thoughts about that. But they do have a detention basin behind it. 
And this used to be, Ames photoshopped this in so it'd look pretty. This actually was part of the parking lot right here. <laughs> So if you do, uh, this is just, don't forget maintenance. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical to keep a rain garden functioning. Uh, this is a beautiful columbine, which attracts lots of bees, butterflies, and other insects, which is a, one of those really wonderful plants to incorporate in a rain garden. Our, the basin where we had uh, our wet plants is down here. These are the sides and this is the drier part up here. This is a, um, a uh, little rain garden established by a, a Sacramento Valley CNPS member. She's on a pretty low site to start with in her area. So she put a rain garden here between her patio and her house because all this runoff turned this pretty much into a swamp anyway, so she went ahead and intentionally made it into a little rain garden. So this is when she first planted it, and this is just a couple years later, and uh, she gives it a little bit of summer water, but not much, and look at that. She is absorbing all that runoff from her roof between her patio and her house now, instead of having it be just basically pretty much mud. So all her plants are California natives, of course, since she is one of the very important people in that chapter. And this only requires occasional summer water. This is our little um, attempt. This used to be a pond, but when our pines died, it got too sunny and I just got tired of dealing with endless maintenance. So uh, Ames helped me. He um, drilled holes in the bottom. We cleared our, everything out. I laid some drain rock in the bottom and some landscape fabric, filled it with a, a mix we put together of native soil, compost, etc. So it would infiltrate. Left these pretty stones here. Planted plants that would tolerate a fair amount of water because this is a low point. And I also do overhead water this area. And uh, this is just four months later. And it is just, it's got Lilium partilinum, hookahs, it's got uh, scarlet monkey flowers, uh, it's got uh, native iris and Pacific Coast hybrid iris, it's got rushes and sedges. And um, I like it a lot because it's beautiful and wildlife attracting and it also is really nice. It's in our 30 foot fire safe zone. It's fully irrigated so it's, uh, combining a lot of functions and it's not particularly flammable. So this is at the Elderberry Farms Native Plant Nursery in Sorrento, Cordova. This is a project of the Sacramento Valley CMPS. As part of that and Soilborn Farms, I decided to create this mixture of basically a Berman Basin Water Garden and a butterfly waste station with help from some professionals. They had this really nice design done. They have a natural waddle weirs up at the top to slow the water coming in from this big open area here. Uh, and then they have a series of basins. As you can see, many different basins with berms connected with armored swales. And then they've got cobble at the bottom basins and they're sinking all that water. So this is what it looked like, all these infiltration basins and swales, when they basically uh, finished but hadn't planted it. They've got a nice decomposed granite path here and permeable pavers here to pick up any additional moisture. So the whole area is ready for planting. And this is what it looks like a couple years later. And I haven't been back this year, but I expect it's even more filled in. And they've got signage and all these amazing, you can have quite a diversity of plants because you can have your moisture loving plants in the basins, your drought tolerant plants up on the, the um, berms. And um, it's just a, a really great way to deal with a slope and filtering and maintaining this uh, water system and they have put some drip in here 
but basically it's a low water use garden. When I uh, did the SNA course up there in Lake Tahoe, they very kindly provided lots and lots of drawings to go along with it. Um, they, uh, they do this to make things easier for the contractors who have to obey all these regulations about uh, uh, construction and maintenance and gardening in the whole Lake Tahoe Basin. And uh, th these documents are available at our website as well. So these are guidelines that I was given that uh, I've uh, passed on. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure what you um, uh, would um, Google to get into this, but it's the Lake Tahoe standards and uh, they're really good. And also basically any urban area such as Seattle, Portland, the Bay Area, Santa Cruz, San Luis Obispo, uh, communities like um, uh, that border the Great Lakes, they all have amazingly well-developed uh, rainwater harvesting and low impact development, uh, details, drawings, standards, and guidelines. Uh, Sacramento has some because of the river. Uh, I wish our county would do more in this area and maybe if we start doing it, it will catch on. Um, so there's a lot of information out there. When I say uh, drive around some of the neighborhoods in like North Lake Tahoe, um, I highly recommend that you can see lots and lots of installations and you can see exactly how they work and people are coming up with better ideas every year. And uh, the success of these mitigations, you can actually see, you just wander down to the lake and you see how beautiful and clear the water is. And if you saw it, 20 years ago when it was becoming turbid and you see the difference now, you can see it really makes a big difference. Uh, these are two of the many resources um, I mentioned. Uh, I, you can get them as PDFs and this is what they look like online. But I also do have the actual books. I ordered them and I really like this one with the spiral back on it. Uh, they're really, really good. I mean, if, you, if you're serious about trying to do this, I recommend you especially uh, get this handbook here. You, the PDF's online, it's on our resource uh, list that is posted on our website. And if you wanna order it, you can order it and it's quite affordable. This one is from the state of Oregon. It's quite similar, it's also very good, but this one has a lot more detail because Seattle actually pays people to put in rain gardens. Isn't that wonderful? And they come out and freely inspect and help you with your rain garden. So they put together this book to really make it easy for people. Um, these are some of the uh, examples of communities that have low impact development documents available to help you out. Um, Puget Sound, Portland, the Central Coast Water Board, Leedy, UC Davis has it. Um, and I, uh, I just got lost on the internet with so much information. Um, so I, I went as Hort Chair and decided it would be helpful if I did a plant list specifically for bioswales and rain gardens so that um, it would give you a little guidance. You certainly don't have to limit yourself to this and there are some non-native plants that will fit in with our natives if you want to add them. Um, it has small trees, large shrubs, smaller shrubs, perennials, uh, ground cover, succulents, and vines. Um, these symbols here are just telling you some of the wildlife value of these plants. There's a column for flower color, height, width. Uh, this is an important column for a rain garden. It tells you what zone these plants are most adapted to, whether it's the inundation zone of one, whether it's two or three, or whether there's a few of them that actually can be used in all three zones if you uh, give them some irrigation. Um, I'm hoping this will help people uh, when they're making choices. Uh, we kind of come to the end. I love this quote. Aldo Leopold was one of my heroes when I was young. Um, and I feel that it kind of sums up what we're trying to do in in all our environmental organizations right now with so much pressure 
on the land and the climate we're dealing with. So um, that's it uh, for now. We're very happy to take questions from people um, that our moderator will give and we'll do our best to help you out. Well, thank you very much, Ames and Nancy. Uh, we're getting some, we're getting thanks uh, in, uh, in the chat to the two of you. So um, they share this feeling, definitely. Uh, while people are putting their questions in the chat, uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll just pose one of my own and uh, say, uh, and uh, what about, uh, say, at, are there solutions for, hey, I have, I have my gutters on my, on my, coming down my house with my rainwater and I have my irrigation, my have, I have my plants out here, but in between I have uh, a, a, a sidewalk or a patio or something like that, you know, some, let's just call it, you know, it's cement concrete, you know, it's, it's, it's a non-permeable layer that I have to get the water past in order to get to the place where I want the rainwater to go. Is there something you might suggest for that beyond jackhammering out the sidewalk? I, I've been to your place, Chrissy. You're talking about the patio in front? I am actually, yes. Yeah, well, you do have a planter in front of that, a brick, right? It, but it ends and, and, and off to the kind of the left as you face the house, I have what has been a dry stream bed, but I'm thinking, well, you know, uh, the plants there, I have juncus, I have uh, some maples not too far, um, and I have a couple of the things I was thinking of putting in. I was thinking, well, that might be a perfect place to do this uh, because I could, if I could get the water there, I already have the dry stream bed set up and I, I might be able to not have to start completely from scratch. So you have rain gutters? Yes, no. we have rain gutters. The rain gutter is, of course, attached to the house, but yes. And does it just flow onto that patio or where does it, it, it flows. It flows onto the gravel, which is slightly to the left of the house, where you could drive along the gravel around to the back of the house. It's uh, fairly compacted gravel. Yeah. But it, it, the water does go down into the, so I don't use the water for anything related to plants. And I was thinking if I could get it to go into the dry stream bed, then down at uh, kind of towards the bottom of the dry stream bed, I could put some more water loving plants. You know, you can get a rain a downspout adapter and, mm -hmm. and you can attach piping to that and underground it to that area. It's a lot of work, oh. but you could do that. And I'm assuming your concrete patio does slope away from your house. So that water probably is headed for your lawn anyway, right? Yes, as far as I, I, we never see any puddling. We have a right. couple of, yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of different systems for adapting a downspout. Uh, some are corrugated pipes, some are solid, but there's, there, and some are cheaper and more um, functional. Others are more attractive which would allow you to, the, the, to then route that water exactly where you want it without having to like have another swale. Right, okay. Uh, I don't know that helps. Oh, mm -hmm. No, that's great, that's helpful. Depending on the situation, you could do a slip drain at the edge of the uh, concrete patio. And is, um, okay. a slip drain is, it's a, it's a usually U-shaped or it's open at the top with a grate and it collects water oh. and mm -hmm. transfers it laterally. Mm -hmm. If that's headed in the right direction, you've got the correct slope, you could take that to a rain garden. Okay. The but trouble with that is you probably have to jackhammer concrete, which is not fun. No, I mean at, at the edge. <laughs> at the edge, yeah. You could put something at the edge of the patio, but um, to catch the water. What, got what, it. Uh, some kind right, of right at the edge there. Mm -hmm. And then route it from there, but yeah, you know, without seeing where you're exactly your downspout comes right. 
Let's it's not, kind of hard to tell you what yeah. would be best. Okay. This is Thank where you. it's really good to get your Wellington boots on and go out during a heavy rain. Yes. And watching where the water goes and in what volume it goes. Yet another reason to look forward to the rains. Next yes. time I come up for Chrissy, we can look at it. Perfect. <laughs> somebody, and somebody else asks, how do you maintain the berms after a few seasons? Are you adding mulch or other material? Yeah, we didn't really talk about it, although there was some wording on that on the slide, and there's a lot of information in these booklets. Yeah, the berm, um, it, it, the part that goes underwater, obviously, and is inundated, you wouldn't mulch. But the sides of the berm could be mulched with uh, rock and cobble or with just a very uh, coarse mulch. Uh, and you've already kind of compacted the soil so that it's, it's not going to give way. Uh, and then every, you kind of maintain it like you would uh, a slope as far as uh, keeping the mulch in place. And of course, once the plant roots penetrate, it's pretty stable. And how do you how do you calculate uh, appropriately the uh, the uh, the angle for the sides of the berm so you don't make it uh, so steep that erosion will take place? Right. Well, you need to plan. That's part of planning your garden with laying it out both in plan view and section view. Um, I, I don't suggest you do a, a steep slope because it it's basically going to fail at some point and it's very hard to maintain. Uh, three in one or four in one is more practical. Probably a three in one, which means three feet, feet horizontal for every vertical uh, foot. So the, the gentler sides give you a lot more planting opportunity. So I think it's a good idea to give yourself enough room to do that. So you don't have to push your dirt, the side of the berm steep but more gradual. That way too, you have more planting opportunities. I think the, uh, the, the books don't all agree, but I think a, a, a three in one or four in one slope is as steep as you'd ever want to go. Okay. Um, somebody else asks, it says, I have a steep bank that runs along and above a gravel road. The road gets flooded when it rains. Would it be reasonable to put in the equivalent of French drain along the road and put period, periodic drain pipes underneath to take the water to the other side? Or do you have other suggestions? How to keep the road from getting flooded below the steep well, bank? Uh, water is the enemy of roads and you definitely want to try and keep the water away from the road itself. So, you know, the traditional way is to have some kind of ditch along the road. If you go driving around the county and you look at the county roads, for instance, they are quite often badly engineered and then they collect water. They don't sink any of the water, they collect it and set it into culverts over to the other side of the road and there's often erosion. So this is where you think it out right from the beginning. How can you slow down that water and how much water, you know, what rain events are you planning for? You know, if you're gonna plan for an inch an hour events um, that's a, going to probably be a fairly difficult problem to solve. But just slowing it down and putting riprap and uh, maybe even a boulder every now and then, it all depends on the grade of the road and the grade of the ditch. Um, you can sink a great deal of water that way. In the yeah, color. It's, it's hard when you don't, when I can't really visualize it, but is this like a, a county road or a driveway? Well, this is actually, uh, Jean posted this, so you've seen. Okay, it's her driveway? Mm-hmm. Ah, Jean. So she's got a steep bank on both sides of her driveway. Yeah, above and below. The driveway kind of cuts across the steep. Yeah, it's like it on cuts across the slope. And she wants to know how to stop the water, what? From, she, from, from flooding the road. Flooding the road, yeah. Well, that's, it's, I just know how steep that is, so it is a bit of a challenge. Um, I would, you know, I would put a, a this is, I don't know if there is a trench already on the uphill side at the bottom of the bank, but 
she could put a trench in and then direct it to a culvert. And they would have to drill under the road at this point. That's to get the culvert in. When they yeah. built the driveway. Right, yes. <laughs> uh, and then you direct it to a culvert, which uh, would then go under the driveway and you'd have a, a riprap uh, covering on your bank at that point, or you could then direct it to some on contour. Um, I guess we, next time up, up there, Jean, we could talk about that. What can you do that's not gonna be a real big deal? Here's the difficulty. You're concentrating the water uh, leading it somewhere, and then you have to disperse it. You have to disperse the water and disperse the energy that's uh, in the water. So if you can stop it, the collection and concentration of water to begin with, uh, that would be the best. And if you can't, uh, do everything you can to disperse the water itself and the energy it contains uh, afterwards. You can also so your best advice is um, more planting on that uphill steep bank? Yeah, more planting. Also at the very top of the bank, they did this at Briar Patch. They put in a, a, a swale, or you could call it a ditch, but it's an attractive swale and there's bunch grasses on both sides of it. And that carries the water that's draining down toward their parking lot away from that bank. So and meaning... Um, so if, it doesn't sheet down if the bank. property that's even more uphill than hers, then the water yep. that's draining onto her property has a place to sink before it starts going down the steep bank. Yeah, she might want to go and walk that briar patch garden up above their parking lot, see how they handle that. What they did is they, they diverted the water sideways, uh, which is automatically a much less sleep, steep slope. Mm -hmm. And stopped it going down the slope at all. In other words, they mitigated the problem by removing one of the uh, downsides, you know, one of the parameters. Right. So all that water that would have gone down that second tier of banks is being intercepted and sent to a drain inlet, which then has a pipe which goes to a detention basin. It's on a massive scale compared to what she's talking about, but it might give you some ideas of trying to intercept some of that water it's coming down the hill and move it away from your driveway to uh, there might be a basin uphill where you could sink it that's not such a problem. But it really requires um, looking at it and measuring some slopes and you might even want to ha have a contractor look at it if it's a really big problem. Because I know the water could freeze on your driveway, Jean. Yeah, we certainly I don't know if that helped because it's hard to solve such a big problem without being there. Okay. Well, I think uh, that has been, uh, those are the questions so far. I think what this means is that you have given people a tremendous amount to think about. And uh, you also have provided some really good resources for people to look at afterwards. And it, uh, and we'll have this program uh, recorded and it'll be uploaded so people can look at it again later. I know I'm going to be looking at it a second time. Uh, so thank you so much, Nancy and Ames, and I'll turn the floor back to uh, Jean for a final word. Well, I'd like to thank, again, thank the technical team and thank the moderators very yeah, much. Thanks for very help. much. Hi, um, I wanted to, I'm so glad that you could join us and um, I'm really glad that we're going to be able to put this on YouTube so that I for one am going to go back like Chrissy and check out this information again because there's so much that was there. It's wonderful that people can join us and we look forward to seeing you soon. We will have another presentation in, in November, but you'll find out about that in the newsletter and take care everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Just hit stop share, I think.